morning. morning. Welcome to uh, our worship this morning. This is the uh, third Sunday after Epiphany. Uh, we'll follow the order of service on page 203, page 203, so go ahead and put a marker at page 203. Uh, we'll begin our service though by singing our first hymn 685 and 685. <clears throat>
And since we are gathered to hear God's word, to call upon him in prayer and praise, and to receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. And Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake, he forgives you all of your sins as a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We speak together the introit. The introit is printed on the back of our bulletin. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Praise the Lord. Praise those servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. From this time forth and forevermore. The Lord is high above all nations, and his glory above the heavens. He raises the poor from the dust, and lifts the needy from the ash heap. To so make them sit with princes, and with the princes of his people. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. We'll continue as we sing the Kyrie. It begins on page 204, followed by the glory.
everlasting God, mercifully look upon our infirmities and stretch forth the hand of your majesty to heal and defend us. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The Old Testament lesson from God's Holy Word this morning is from the book of the prophet Jonah, chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This lesson is from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 7. <coughs> this is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as they had done, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord. How to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things. How to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit. Not to lay any restraint upon you. But to promote good order. And to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now turn in our hymnals to page 205, page 205. Please stand as we sing our Hallelujah words. Jesus said to them, follow me, and 
and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, who were in the boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed Jesus. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. We confess our Christian faith together in one voice as we profess the words of the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed is on page 206. We confess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us sinned, and for our salvation, came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory, judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I will look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. Hey, you see that we sing our next hymn. 839 and 839. <laughs>
Savior Jesus. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, Jonah preached the perfect sermon. I know that's a pretty mighty claim, and before I tell you what makes his sermon so perfect, I'm going to share a little interaction I once had with one of my old church members up there in South Dakota. You might have heard me say this before, Bible class. Again, I don't ever, I, I lose track of where I say what and when. But, uh, so here, here it was. I was visiting one of my members in the hospital up there. And another visitor walked into the room. We all engaged in some small talk for a few moments. And then I got up to leave. But before I left, this gentleman, uh, you know, he's an older guy, and he, he said, I got some advice for you. Because, Grant, this was about six years ago. Do you think I, I look young now? I think about six years ago, I had a lot less white hair up here. But he goes, I got some advice for you, young and pastor, he goes. He said, you know, there is one thing that makes for the perfect biscuits and sermons, and that's shortening. <laughs> that was his advice to this young pastor six years ago. And again, that, this is not the first time I've heard something like that. So keeping that in mind, Jonah's perfect sermon was short. His sermon to the city of Nineveh was simply this, verse 4 of the Old Testament lesson. Jonah preached, he opened his mouth, the word of God came from his mouth and said, Ye, uh, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Amen. That's it. No introductory uh, illustrations, no exposition on the scriptures, no application for the Ninevites' everyday lives. Just simply that one short sentence. And it was the perfect sermon. Now, we, we joke and might think it was a good sermon because it was sharp and to the point. And there are times, even for myself, when you know I have a rough week or uh, you know, get into Advent and Lent and I have two sermons a week to do and throw in a funeral or something like that. And I, and I wish that maybe I could just come and stand up in this pulpit and say one sentence and that will be the sermon. Maybe some of you might like that too. I don't know. <laughs> but Jonah's sermon was perfect for some different and very important reasons. First, Jonah's sermon was perfect despite who he was. Or in other words, <laughs> it's a wonder that Jonah's sermon had the results that it did because, frankly, Jonah was a pretty terrible preacher. Now, I understand that he was a bad preacher because he was boring or because, you know, he didn't crack any jokes in his sermon or even that he was a bad preacher because his sermon was so short. Even short to my boy. No, Dermot, Jonah was a bad preacher because he didn't want to be a preacher. Jonah was a bad preacher because he tried to run away from God's command for him to go and preach. Jonah was a bad preacher because he felt that the people of Nineveh didn't even deserve God's word. And he didn't want to bring it to them. And yet, despite all of that, God got in there. He took a giant fish to do it. You all know that account of the scriptures. And so the fish vomited Jonah on to the shores near Nineveh, and he walked into the city. And Jonah gave that perfect sermon. 
So secondly, Jonah's sermon was perfect based on looking at the results of that sermon. So just look what happened after he opened his mouth and preached. This is verse 5 from the Old Testament lesson. It says, And the people of Nineveh believed God, and they called for a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. Now later on in the book of Jonah, God tells us that the number of people that did this was 120,000. 120,000 people heard Jonah's sermon or heard his message or heard it repeated, and they believed it. Not only did they believe it, but they changed their lives because of it. They all turned back to God. They repented of their sins, and they lived. Jonah's perfect sermon had an impact. Which leads us to the third and last reason why Jonah's sermon was so perfect. It was perfect because his sermon was not his own. No, it was the preached, it was the proclaimed, it was the very inspired word of God. And that one sentence sermon, that was God's exact verbatim message that he gave to Jonah that Jonah did not want to repeat and yet that got to the ears and the hearts of the Ninevites for them to repent of their sins. <laughs> you see, this is how God's word works. We sometimes try to escape it we do not always want others to hear it. We don't want to listen to it, especially if it's really condemning. And yet, it always finds us when we need it, bringing us the message that we are in dire need of and working in our hearts and in our minds to the glory of God. And God rejoices at this. And this is what happens with the people of Nineveh, who were moments from destruction. After God's very own words had reached their ears through Jonah's sermon, and they were changed by it, verse 10 says this, When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Well, dear friends in Christ, I'm not Jonah. And my sermons are far from perfect, and I'll be the very first one to admit that. Now, I'm never going to bring an entire city to repentance, through a one-sentence sermon. I will most likely never be in the running, even for Lutheran Hour Speaker. I'm even still thankful that you let me in this pulpit Sunday after Sunday. But despite who I am, God still speaks to you through His preached Word today. And I'm pretty sure that I'll never tell you, though, that our city is going to be overthrown, like Nineveh. And you most likely will never put on sackcloth and ashes after one of my sermons. But God's preached word still has an effect on you after you encounter it here. For example, I go like this. It may be that I preach a, a sermon about baptism. You know, 
two or three weeks ago, we had the baptism of Jesus Sunday. And maybe you are encouraged in your life to know more and keep in mind your baptism all the days of your life. Or maybe when you hear a sermon about Jesus being crucified as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, you might go out and live in appreciation of the new life you have in the forgiveness of your sins. You may, may be moved to forgive others. Or it may even be if you have to come to God's house and hear a sermon preached from God's word, maybe at a funeral, that you might find comfort in the fact that since God raised Jesus from the dead, he will also raise us from the dead the loved one who is lying here before us. God's word still comes to you in not so perfect sermons, but nonetheless he still uses them to work in your life <coughs> to remind you of his will to give you the comfort <coughs> that he knows you need. To remind you that he has relented in smiting you. That's the good news for today. God has relented in smiting you. But rather has given you new life in Christ Jesus. So my sermon today was not as short as Jonah's. Like I said, I don't think they'll ever will be, unfortunately, for you. But we have God's promise that his word goes out and does not return to him empty. Rather, it accomplishes his purposes. And so I'll leave you with one other one-sentence sermon that we heard today. And this one-sentence sermon actually comes from Jesus in the gospel lesson. You know, when he was doing much the same thing as Jonah, except... Jesus was doing it willingly, being obedient to his Father as he preached this. This is verse 15 of Mark chapter 1, our gospel lesson. Jesus preaches, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Sure. Sweet. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding guard our hearts and minds in the one true faith, even into life everlasting. Amen. Our service uh, continues with our prayers. Uh, take note of uh, uh, we added a, a prayer for Mr. Larry Anderson. Larry was the uh, school principal here uh, three, four years ago. Uh, he was diagnosed with stage four cancer. So pray for Larry and his treatment options going forward. I'll conclude each of my uh, uh, petitions by saying, Lord, in your mercy, congregation responds by saying, hear our prayer. So please stand as we join in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you desire not the death of a sinner, but that all would repent and believe the gospel. In the epiphany of your Son, your time of salvation and your kingdom have come near. And this world, as this world passes away, give faithfulness and urgency to your church to proclaim the gospel of our God to all people. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Lord of the harvest, as you called Simon Peter and Andrew and James and John to follow you and made them fishers of men, so send faithful preachers of your gospel in our time. Increase the spirit of generosity to all who support the missionaries, seminaries, colleges, and other institutions of our church for the spread of the gospel and the service of the church. 
Lord, in your mercy, Merciful Father, turn us from every distracting anxiety and the dealings of this world that would draw our hearts away from your blessed gospel and its end, eternal life. Give us confidence in the resurrection and the peace of a clean conscience by the forgiveness of sins in Jesus' name. Graciously behold and help those for whom we pray, especially for Larry, John, Margaret, Marilyn, Jill, Ethley, Tom, Laura, Bill, and John, and all those whom we now name silently in our hearts according to their needs. Grant them peace and comfort, and if it be your will, healing. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Gracious Lord, in your holy sacrament, you deliver the gospel proclaimed by your Son and won by his death in his true body and blood. Work repentance and faith in all who commune and unite them in a sincere confession of your divine truth at this altar. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again, and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We turn now in our hymnal to page 208, page 208, and we continue with the service of the sacrament. <coughs> the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should in all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. And now we praise you that you sent your only begotten Son, and that in him, being found in fashion as a man, you manifested the fullness of your glory. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying. Our Lord Jesus took bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it 
and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after supper, he also took the cup, and after he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
Jesus and the drinking of his blood strengthen and preserve you in both body and soul in the one true faith, even into life everlasting. Depart now in his peace. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. See the Nunc Dimittis, page 211. Page 211. Seeing none, we close on our last hymn from 730 and 730. 